Welcome to Intelligence Squared, uh, which obviously the title is based on the mathematical concept of taking a figure and raising it to the power of two to produce a substantially larger result, or a more impressive result. So it's appropriate we have two people here, uh, Stephen D. Levitt, uh, economist from the University of Chicago, and Stephen J. Dubner, a journalist from the New York Times, who a few years ago came together in a spectacularly successful symbiotic relationship to rival anything in nature. But which is the crafty cl which is the crafty clownfish, which is the poisonous anemone? I'll leave you to judge in the course of the evening. And as we've just been reminded, they together created this uh, Freakonomics phenomenon with their books, uh, Freakonomics, Super Freakonomics, and now Think Like a Freak, uh, which we're going to be concentrating on this evening. But I dare say we can cover all the span of the. Of, of this work. Now, normally when I'm interviewing people on uh, television or radio, I have to assume the proportion of the audience uh, don't really know what we're going to be talking about, uh, so they might not know who the guest is really or the subject matter. But I imagine everyone here at the Royal Geographical Society must be here because they're either Freakonomic fans or freaks or determined critics ready with their uh, questions later to put them to the sword. So the, the, what we'll do is, uh, after I finish this little preamble, or, or ramble, I suppose. Uh, I'll, I'll ask as many uh, questions as I can think of to uh, jog, them, jog them along and to go over some of the interesting, even controversial topics discussed in uh, this and previous books. And then we'll come to you. The main point of the evening is for you to ask questions. I'll do my best to, to get questions and take questions from all parts of the room. Um, I think we've got roving microphones and all that jazz. So I'm basically here auditioning uh, to be the, uh, the Speaker of the House of Commons or a, or a, or a minor <laughs> member of the Dimbleboo family, should uh, one of them <laughs> ever stop. But um, that's unlikely. Um, anyway, so I'm assuming you all know uh, what, what this is all about. Uh, but uh, just, just in case, I should say that uh, uh, Stephen Levitt is a free-thinking or freak-thinking economist, teaches at the University of Chicago, and Stephen Dubner, oh, I've said this, I'm a writer and journalist. Anyway, they met uh, when um, Levitt met Dubner, Dubner met Levitt, uh, when Dubner was interviewing uh, Levitt for a profile in the New York Times. So right from the word go, I'm terrifically impressed that you came together in these circumstances. If only I could develop an empathy to the guests I interview. Um, who knows, I could have become the fourth BG or uh, Jeff <laughs> Jeffrey Archer's co-writer or, or Cher's next husband, but it wasn't to be in any of those cases. In the <laughs> just to take some of my failures. In their books, uh, uh, they've used economics to analyze subjects and problems out with the normal economic sphere, and also looked at areas of economics in a variety of different ways, sometimes flying in the face of conventional wisdom. Uh, this has led them to propound a number of interesting, even startling theories about the rituals of the Ku Klux Klan, the relative value of estate agents and prostitutes pimps, terrorism and life insurance, the link between legalization of abortion and the reduction in crime, teachers cheating, even max fi match fixing in sumo wrestling, swimming pools, guns, um, and there's a hot dog eating contest which we might uh, come on to first. But their latest book returns to some of those themes, cites new examples, and promises to tell us all how to think smarter about almost uh, everything. So, um, I may start with the, the journalist, and, uh, with the questions. Apart from providing a snappy title, what is it that makes you two freakonomics, freak economists, or freaks? What, what is the, what's the essence of it? I will answer that. First of all, you're great, and I think you should just keep going. Uh, <laughs> but since we're supposed to talk, I'd like to just begin with, uh, please say cheese. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, so, sorry, the question, yeah, uh, so let, let me, um, so you gave the outlines of our meeting, let yes. me just go back and we'll start there and, okay. uh, and um, so as you said, I am a journalist and I was yeah. working on a book about what I thought of as the psychology of money, which is why money is a thing that makes so many people so crazy and irrational and so I'd been interviewing a lot of people, spending time with um, a lot of economists, none of whom, by the way, knew anything about money, okay, yes. at all. And, uh, and my editor at the New York Times asked me if I would go to Chicago to write a profile of this economist named Steve Levitt, who had just won an award. It was called the John Bates Clark Medal, and it's a very esteemed award. And um, just to show how much less smart I am than the economist, I immediately turned down the assignment mm. because I was neck deep in my book and I wanted to finish that. Um, but then uh, I turned it down another couple times. And finally, I was going to be in Chicago for something else and decided, you know what, let me read his papers 
and see if maybe it's, it's worth stopping in. So I downloaded and read Levitt's papers, and they were just this cornucopia of fascinating, bizarre stories about cheating sumo wrestlers and whether the first name you give your baby affects that child's outcome. And they had nothing to do with what I thought of as economics. And they were also incredibly clever, not just in their description of the world, but in how they proved their points through data. And so that was very appealing to me. And so I decided to interview him and did. Mm. Enjoyed it very much. Well, let's just, just break off. So were you looking forward to being interviewed by this oh, God, smart no. ass <laughs> journalist from New York that <laughs> was going to write everything down and then report it wrongly? Or was that just in Britain? <laughs> <laughs> so um, pretty much Dubner has come to know that my favorite activity is sitting alone in a room uh, with a computer and data, and, and I'm pretty antisocial. I don't like people very much. And so the only reason that I was willing to do this interview with Dubner is that I have a rule. And the rule is that um, I like to make my mom happy. And my mom read the New York Times, and I liked, and it makes my mom happy when she sees me in the New York Times. So I agreed to do this <coughs> interview. Now, on the other hand, Dubner came under the pretense he was already going to be in Chicago. And uh, we negotiated that he would stay for two hours to interview me. And uh, at the end of those two hours, which went pretty well, everything was pretty civil, he said, well, how would you feel if I tagged along for lunch? Now, I didn't really want him to come to lunch with me, but the thing is, <laughs> when you're being interviewed by a reporter from the New York Times, you have to be nice to them, right? Because they have tremendous power, and as soon as you do something mean, you're sure they're going to embarrass you and write something terrible. So he came to lunch. And that was fine. I said, well, it was really great meeting you. You know, I hope the piece turns out great. And uh, she said, well, actually, I don't have anything to do this afternoon. Uh, how, would you, uh, how would you feel if I came and, uh, and joined you uh, for the afternoon? And I said, well, um, that would be fine, except my only plans for this afternoon were to do my favorite thing, which was to go into my office and shut the door and type you know, with data, play with data for four or five hours. He said, oh, no problem. I'll just, I'll just come and watch, OK? So, yeah. uh, <laughs> but the thing was, Dubner cannot stop talking, OK? He, he had read every paper I'd ever written, and he would ask me a question. And I would answer the question. And as soon as I stopped, he would ask me another question. This went all the way through, and then dinner. OK, we had dinner together. Mm. And then I finally offered to give him a ride back to his hotel, hoping I would be rid of him forever. And he said, you know, how about you pick me up at 8 AM tomorrow morning, which starts this over. So you're, you're a freak in the term, you're like a stalker, more than <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. yes. So I didn't mean to interrupt, but yeah, there, there no. must, yeah. and, so, unless, look, unless you've never parted since then, there must come a point when you... <laughs> Barely. Yeah. So, so this was started on a Wednesday morning, and by Friday afternoon, so we'd all day Thursday for 12 hours, and Friday morning, I pick him up again at the hotel, and by Friday afternoon, I was so desperate, nearly suicidal, that <laughs> we ended up at a... It's a little different in the UK, because going to like a betting shop is kind of natural in the UK, but only the lowest of the low in the United States go to off-track betting stock places. Yeah. So we are getting drunk in an off-track betting shop uh, in the US when Dubner, after like 33 hours of interrogation, uh, and Dubner says to me, uh, so um, how, uh, uh, what do you think about the, the CIA? Uh, which CIA is the organization in the U.S. which is charged with you know, uh, undercover investigations and, and yeah. catching terrorists. Yeah, we've heard and, of the CIA. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I, I, I blurted out without thinking, uh, if I had the right data, I would be so much better than the CIA at catching terrorists. Okay? And the, the moment the words passed my mouth, I thought, oh my god, why did I say that? That was so stupid. But I figured 36 hours of transcripts, what were the chances that that would end up in the article? And uh, I knew Dubner was good when the article was published a few months later, and the last line of the last paragraph was me throwing down the gauntlet to the CIA, saying how I would be better than a catching terrorist. And yes. Well, that's a, that's a general rule of being interviewed by a journalist. The, the one thing you say, you think, <laughs> I wish I hadn't said that. <laughs> that's the thing that's, that's in there. So anyway, so having seized upon that, yeah, I seized. can we just zoom to the point where either one of you decided this could be a book or this could well, be a, more than just a profile? So I did not hate him as much as he hated me, <laughs> but I had no, we weren't thinking about doing the book at all. No. So it was my, he was just thinking of getting rid of you. That he was, was thinking it, about yeah. getting rid of me. And when I wrote the article, I, mm. I loved it, but I was sure that no one would read, would read it because it's an article about an academic economist 
doing this research about sumo wrestlers and whatnot, and it was coming out in August in the New York Times Magazine. And the only articles they put in the magazine in August are the ones they want to bury, because yeah. people are at the beach, they're not going to be reading the magazine. So it's eight pages about him in mm -hmm. August, and I fully expected the article to be a total dud, which is what most things that most writers write turn out to be. There's a, the period right before a book or uh, an article comes out that we writers call the lull before the lull. It's very, <laughs> it's very quiet, then the piece comes out and it's still very quiet. Yeah. And my, my uh, fear was confirmed when the morning the article came out in the New York Times Magazine, my phone rang mm. once and it was Levitt's mom back in <laughs> Minneapolis. She said, I just wanted to thank you for treating my boy fair in the New York Times. <laughs> And I thought that three months I just spent was the stupidest, biggest waste of time mm. possible. But then, as it turns out, we were wrong because people were interested in a book. It took some cajoling, because um, Levitt had no interest in working with me on it, yeah. anything at all, right? So how does it work? Do you, do you come up with all these brilliant um, analyses or ideas to look at, things to think about, and say, right, you're, you're the journalist, write it up in a, in a way that makes uh, sense? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a mix. I mean, um, look, I couldn't in a million years write a book that any of you would want to read. And that's what I told the publishers when they first came and said, hey, uh, you know, Dubner has written about you. You should, you should write a book. And, I, I, and what I said was, well, go to my webpage and read a handful of my academic articles, which get about, I don't know, 100 downloads a year each, uh, and then come back if you really think you want me to write a popular book. And I will say none of the publishers did come back after <laughs> I told them that. <laughs> but uh, then uh, somebody came up with the, uh, with the idea that we should write this book together. And, uh, and, and I, I wasn't very excited about it. Dubner wasn't very excited about it. But one thing that we did uh, come to realize is that there was a commonality that we shared, which is that basically for enough money, either of us would do anything. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and then we yeah. got, uh, you know, we, and it turned out, you know, the publishers were willing to give us enough money. And then, but then the key thing, I mean, really a critical moment in, uh, in the relationship was deciding how to, how to split the money, right? We had, we had gotten the sum, but we'd never talked about a split. And it was really, uh, everything kind of hung in the balance because if you've ever been, say, divorced and had to argue about a zero-sum game of how to split up the assets, you know how contentious it can be. And so Dubner called me on the phone a little bit hesitant, and he said, well, you know, I, I just wanted to talk about the split. I said, okay. And he said, I, I'm thinking that uh, we should maybe split the money 60-40. And I said, uh, well, I was actually thinking two-thirds, one-third. And he's kind of quiet, and he said, well, uh, I guess we're not going to be able to do the book then because there's no way I can, I can do this book for just one-third of, of the pie. Mm. And I said, oh, actually, I was thinking two-thirds for you and one-third for me. <laughs> and he said, oh, I was thinking 60% for you and 40% yeah. for me. So we settled on 50-50, and we've actually there's yeah. been a really yes. good set okay. of good tone for the relationship. All right. Um, well, look, uh, I, I think we've covered the, you, you coming together. It's, it's sure. a very romantic yeah. story. This is, it's... A, it's a, <laughs> It feels more like a rom-com than, than, than anything else. <laughs> so you didn't like each other at first, then you fell in love, and then... Right. Uh, anyway, that's, that's fine. So let's, let's come to this, this, this latest book, and we can go back to some of those other more serious examples that uh, you've covered before. But, but writing this book, this one, you're telling us that we can all... We've read your previous books, maybe, and we can now think like a freak. Um, and are people going to apply these, these theories, your theory, his theory, uh, in, uh, in other... So one example you give, and it's on the cover, so it's a good one to start with, is uh, somebody you, you feel thought like a freak in order to, to win uh, a hot dog eating contest. So how, explain how that works and how you can think like a freak and win mm -hmm. a hot dog eating contest. Do you want this one? Sure. Yeah, I'll take it. So, yeah, so... Um, so let's imagine that you're a broke college student, which is the situation that uh, this fellow named Kobe, a Japanese college student, was in. And his girlfriend signed him up for this um, televised eating contest on TV. And he was kind of horrified because he, he's a slight guy and not gluttonous at all, but it was worth $5,000 if he could win. So he decided to enter it, and he strategized a little bit. We won't get into that detail right now. But he ended up winning his first amateur contest and then decided that because he could win as an amateur eater, he should turn pro. And that, that this field of competitive uh, eating was, um, was where his future lied. What do, you, what, do, what do you make as a pro hot dog eater? I mean, obviously you make... <laughs> 
you make a lot of pounds, uh, yeah, but yeah. Uh, and you get plenty to eat. But do you make? Is it sponsored? Uh, there are appearance fees. Just yeah. as the best golfers will get an appearance fee, right? Yeah. Or maybe um, you yourself might. I'm just inferring. Uh, <laughs> might gain an appearance fee just for showing up and looking handsome. Um, he could show up to just eat. Just showing up in my case. Exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So uh, he decided that he would train for what is the ultimate, the kind of the Super Bowl of competitive eating, which is the Coney Island, Nathan's famous 4th of July hot dog eating contest in New York City, mm -hmm. where the existing world record at the time, this had been going on for about 40 years, the existing world record was 25 and 1 8 hot dogs and buns in 12 minutes. So just imagine mm -hmm. the volume and, and, yes. and what that is. And most of the former champions were these big, hulking guys who would starve themselves for a few days and then take the pile and just glomp, 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 wash it down, swallow and do it and so. So he began to study the past competitors. And he quickly came to the realization that just because they all ate in the same way from each other and in the same way that uh, the same style as you would eat every day, that that was not necessarily the best way to eat. So we thought, what if I experiment, try some different things? So first thing he did was very simple. I'll pick up a hot dog, and instead of eating it with two hands, feeding it like this, what if I could break the hot dog in half uh, and then have two hands to feed it, and it will do some of the work that my jaw is doing? So this, this maneuver would, over time, come to be known as the Solomon method, after King Solomon in the Bible, who threatened to cut the baby in two pieces, right? So he did the Solomon, then he starts to eat the dog and bun, and he realizes that eating dog and bun together, there's a density conflict, right? One is very dense and salty and slick, and the other is big and airy. So he thought, what if I separate them? And he, he does this, and now he finds that he can just kind of slurp the hot dog down, mm -hmm. and the bun is big and airy, takes up a lot of time and a lot of room. So now he starts to take the bun, soak it in the water, squeeze out the excess water, and pop it in the mouth like a bun ball, okay? Mm -hmm. And then further, he doesn't need to pause later to drink like the other guys because he will have already delivered the liquid. So he goes on and on and on, all these different methods and strategies, many of which failed, but he, he was experimenting. He gets to Coney Island, and in his first ever real hot dog eating contest, he goes out, and as I said, the world record was 25 and an eighth. He doesn't just win his first contest, but he sets a new world record. And he doesn't just barely set the record, he eats 50 hot dogs in buns in 12 minutes. So it was an astonishing, I mean, yeah. nobody doubles a world record ever. So immediately, there were charges of cheating. Uh, they, they suspected he was doping, for one, that he had been um, yeah. swallowing muscle yeah. relaxants. There was a rumor that he was a Japanese government plot to embarrass America on Independence yeah. Day, and that surgeons had uh, implanted a second esophagus and stomach, which was not true. But the point we make, yeah. sorry, this has a point. Yeah. The point we make is that what he did was he asked a fundamentally different question than everybody before him had asked, which was all these other big guys were asking, how do I make more room in my stomach? which seems pretty sensible, you know, if I want to eat a lot of hot dogs. And he asked a fundamentally different question, which was, how do I make a hot dog easier to eat? And by asking a fundamentally different question, he came up with a fundamentally different set of answers, which glorified his name to the state. So in the hot dog world, he's a bit like, uh, what was he, was he, was he Dick Fosbury, the, the Fosbury flop, the, the guy who yeah, reinvented great, yeah. high jump. Very and, much so. Uh, didn't have quite so. Wait, but he certainly he won all the, the Olympics and stuff. He did, and ever since the way then, of nobody's doing. jumped forward ever yeah. since Fosbury. Well, what's, what's interesting about the Fosbury flop is that the, having talked to a pretty good high jumper once, the difference between the old way of doing it and his way of doing it was like a three or four or five percent different. It was, not, it, it was yeah. a tiny bit better, yeah. but not radically at all. In fact, there's some people who don't, who, who actually right. still go at it the other way. That's, I mean, obviously, in some sense, people cared more about the high jump than they did about eating hot dogs. But, yes, I think. But, uh, but, um, but the transformation that he made, I mean, mm. it really, it was, I mean, we used the example of a comparison to Usain Bolt and running the, the, um, the, the 100 meter dash. And so it would be the equivalent of him running the 100 meter dash in 4.7 seconds. Yeah. So basically like a cheetah or a <laughs> taxi cab <laughs> or something like yeah, that. Yeah, you can't even achieve that with the, uh, some of the methods they resort to exactly. in athletics, and I'm not suggesting the same book. The of a politician being truthful 70% of the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. So that's that's a that's a. But that's he, you're saying he was thinking like a freak. You didn't teach him to. That you just seized no, upon that as a, no. that's an example of uh, you, what you like to see in people's thought processes. Exactly. I think we we if we had a if we had a free economics hall of fame, he would certainly be a charter member because yeah. he just he he did what is incredibly simple, 
and obvious. And, and it's really what, what the greatest ideas, I think, are the ones that are completely and totally obvious ex post, and yet there are hundreds of thousands of people who just do the same thing over and over and over, never think to do it, and as soon as someone else does it, it's totally obvious, and everyone switches yeah. immediately. And that, that, to me, is genius. That, to me, is brilliance, of being able to see what everyone should have seen but didn't. To me, that's a lot, in some ways, more fundamentally a sign of genius than just having a super high IQ and being able to figure out math problems that no one else can figure L out. Let me go to a, a more serious topic yeah. that you mentioned this book and mentioned previous books and as, as a story that's uh, very much part of the free economics uh, story. Uh, the link that you say exists between the uh, legalization of abortion and the big fall off in the, yeah. in the crime rate so many years later, several yeah. years later. Now, you, you make that link. I think you did that in your very first book. Yes. Uh, could you explain, first of all, how that how you came to that conclusion, sure. and, and do you think it still stands up? Sure. Uh, so let me just explain what, what, uh, what Clive is talking about. So uh, I have put forth the hypothesis with John Donahue back in the late 1990s, uh, and the idea was that, uh, so just as, as a background, so there was a huge decline in crime in the United States that caught everyone by surprise. So essentially by now it's like a 50 or 60, so crime is essentially half what it used to be in the US. And if you look at the, the usual suspects, like increased prisons or more police or changes in social values or income distribution, none of those sufficiently explain this at all. So uh, the, the hypothesis that, uh, well, let me, before I even talk about the hypothesis, let me tell you how, how I stumbled onto the hypothesis. It was just you know, dumb luck in some sense, which is, uh, this is back in the old days when people used to actually read books and go to libraries, and so I happened to be in a library looking up a statistic in a book which is called The Statistical Abstract of the United States, which is about this thick, and it's every figure and table that the US government collects. And so I randomly opened the book to some page as I searched for you know, page 472, which is the page I wanted, and it fell open to the page that listed the number of abortions in the United States. And it just caught my interest. I was kind of curious about abortions, and, uh, and I mean, I'd never thought about it, but when I saw the table, I looked at it, and what was shocking to me was how big the number was. So very quickly after we legalized abortion in the US, there were between 1 million and 1.5 million abortions performed every year. And that was a number that was just shocking to me. I couldn't believe how big that number was. So I asked myself, well, how many, how many babies are actually born in the US? And it turned out the number was about 3 million babies a year. And so I did some simple math. And I said, so you're telling me this book is that almost one third of every pregnancy in the US is ending in abortion, okay? And I knew that <clears throat> before abortion was legalized in, the, in 1973, that very few abortions were performed. And I just thought to myself, I'm not exactly sure what this is gonna affect, but this has got to affect something, right? This just seems like it's gotta be important. And so since I was studying crime and trying to figure out why crime was falling, it took me a week or two where I said, I mean, this is probably crazy, but it is possible that legalized abortion might have affected crime. And, and the theory is actually incredibly simple. The theory is as follows, that uh, um, unwanted children are known to be at a tremendous risk, elevated risk for crime. Basically, if your mother doesn't love you, uh, lots of bad things happen in your life, including turning into a criminal. Okay? Legalized abortion was likely to have dramatically reduced the number of unwanted children because it gave women who got pregnant by accident an outlet uh, other than having the child. So, an unwanted children at risk for crime, there are fewer unwanted children, therefore you would expect that 20 years later when this generation grew up and the unwanted children had been aborted, there wouldn't be as many criminals around. So it's like an incredibly simple theory. It's kind of hard, as, as jarring and um, revolting as the theory is, it kind of makes sense, okay? But people, people hate the idea, but it's kind of, it's, the logic is really simple. So then we went to the data and uh, John Donahue and I, and in the data, uh, I think very clearly using what we call a kind of a collage of data approach, so a bunch of different sources to identify this sort of um, patterns in the data, uh, it really looks to be important. And by our best estimates, maybe a third to a half of all of this incredible decline in crime that happened in America was triggered by the legalization of abortion. And it was but maybe was, one of the most unpopular hypotheses ever put forth. It's unpopular uh, because it's, it's startling, but it's also, some, 
uh, other academics have subjected a lot of criticism to say it's not necessarily true. They, they challenge your methodology. And of course, it's quite a hard thing to prove one way or the other because it could, supposing it was something else causing this. Yeah. Uh, like, I, I mean, just to take a random example that I'm aware of, and I've no idea how true it might be. Some people say not having lead in the petrol sure. mm -hmm. has improved our yeah. brain development. And that might be, because uh, crime is falling in this country as well as America. And uh, of course, it could in both cases be yeah. due to the legalization of abortion, but it might be something else sure. altogether. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so, uh, so on the lead, I, so I have to admit, uh, long before the current round of lead crime research, I looked at that as well. Mm -hmm. So my view was that that wasn't actually true. That when I looked at the data carefully, um, I don't. It's it's not. It's a discussion for a different time. Yeah, day, but, yeah, but but I actually think that that's an extremely plausible hypothesis because there's uh, a link between lead exposure and lower IQ, and um, low IQ is a, a strong predictor of crime. It just it just turns out that it's. I'll, t I'll spend 15 seconds trying to debunk this other yeah. theory, which is. It's kind of interesting, but lead, one, lead is so heavy, it turns out, that and, and really lead only comes from gasoline, that there is lead in paint, but it's not really important. But lead comes from gasoline, but the lead in the gasoline is so heavy that it can't, it gets put up in the, in the air, but it's so heavy that it can only float like 50 or 100 yards. So basically, if you grew up meters, 1500, use meters, right? Yeah, we, we, 15 we, meters, we okay. All right, so fine. Sort of but, uh, age, so basically, if you grew up in the 1960s or 70s next to uh, a freeway, you probably turned into a criminal. Because it is true that the, the <laughs> lead density around freeways would have knocked probably 10 or 20 points off of your IQ by virtue of it. Okay, but in general, yeah. to, for 99.5% of the population, yeah. it probably didn't have any effect whatsoever. And when you look at the data, you can't find it. Yeah. But so there certainly have, believe me, there have been so many critics. We've, uh, I believe that we've given out our data on abortion and crime to maybe 500 different researchers who wanted to test it. And it's really embarrassing to say, but we did in one, in, in table 10 of our paper, the academic paper, we made a mistake. And I'm so regretful of that mistake because although it wasn't really important to the results, uh, it's kind of like, I don't know if you're any or people are following this debate on, on Piketty's capital. Now there's like FT is saying that he made a mistake. And like when you make a mistake, even in one very small part, then everyone for the rest of time assumes that yeah. you made a mistake and everything was totally wrong. But I would say, I mean, look, I'm not, I'm not a very credible source on this topic, because I'm going to say that I think my, my stuff has stood the test of time. But I do really think, actually, that the evidence we've seen has been pretty supportive. And let me say one last thing, which is maybe a little too geeky that this audience doesn't care. But, but it actually turns out that there's something very specific about the abortion problem, which makes it easier to know whether our thesis is true than you otherwise would be the case. And that is that you know, we have a very peculiar thesis, which is that something happens in the world, okay, and then it's not for another 18 or 20 years that that thing has any real impact on society. And so what we have, is, so for instance, what we have in the US is that after abortion was legalized, some states, abortion became very easy to get. In other states, although uh, de jure, although the law said you could get an abortion, Nobody provided abortions. So in the state of North Dakota, there was exactly one legal abortion uh, provided in the first couple of years. Okay, so you have a set of states where it's legal everywhere, but some states there are lots of abortions. Other so you've states got sort of control groups yeah. to work. And with. so what you see is for the next 18 years, the crime patterns in these two sets of states exactly mirror each other, yeah. and then roughly 18 years later, they start slowly breaking apart until, by the full effect of abortion, legalized abortion, as, as kids get older and older and older. There's a 35% difference in yeah. crime, and and it's very hard to come up with another theory. Although there are other other hypotheses you can make that exactly triggers that pattern in the data. And well, so, yeah. so, well, you can see it's an uncomfortable uh, theory to to play with and to think about. It's, it's, it takes you in almost to the area of eugenics, doesn't it? Of, of you know sorting out the population in a way to make society better by knocking out uh, undesirables, not at birth but before <laughs> birth. Sound like a real fact. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, no, um, <laughs> If I recall correctly, Lev, tell me if I don't, but that a lot of the abortions performed were um, with women who were not choosing to not have children at all, mm. but changing the timing. Yeah. And I think that was really a, an element of it, which is that it's not about the people being yeah. bad people, it's about the people being born into a situation that wasn't ready yet, okay. which I think changes the way that you will look at what it means to raise a children, raise a child, and have productive people in society. Can, can I say yeah. completely related to this very much into the new book? So I seem to so, remember you said that he never stops talking, but that's. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so, 
I think this is really perfect for one of the points we make in the new book, which yeah. is this is an issue, the abortion crime, which is so uh, laden with moral and ethical issues that most people, and, and even more so in America, I mean, people in America are, are tied in knots when it comes to, to the legalized abortion. And what's interesting is one of the things we say when you're trying to tackle your own problems is however emotional or, or you know, however moral you think your stance is on a problem, our advice is to start by just putting the morality and the ethical part put it in the background and try to think about a problem in as clear-headed and simple data-driven way as possible, okay? And that helps you to understand the patterns in the world. So basically, I mean, the thing I just said about abortion is completely and totally obvious, right? I mean, unwantedness, it's like the simplest chain of logic imaginable. And yet no one had managed to come up with it in the 30 years, you know, 25 years since abortion had been legalized. And I think that's because as soon as people started to think about abortion, they went off into the moral space and yeah. the ethical space. And by doing that, you can get sense of the world. Now, we're not saying throw the morality out forever. We're saying figure out how the world works, figure out what problem you want to solve, and how do, how, you know, what, the, what steps you can take and what the results would be, and then go back and layer your morality and your ethical views on to deciding what path to take. Okay. I think it's really important. Okay. Now, I just want to cover another topic, get you to deal with another serious topic, which is uh, climate change, global warming. You, you discussed this at uh, some length in your book. Now, you um, uh, endorse, as it were, or discuss a possible solution to global warming, which, get, which is a particularly freaky one. Uh, have I said enough about that to nudge you into telling us what that is? Or? You have indeed. So yeah. you're picking all the fun topics tonight, I see, abortion and climate change. So, so, um, so yeah, so let me, um, let me uh, frame the, the, what we were trying to accomplish. This was in our second book, Super Freakonomics, where we basically looked at the situation of climate change and, and posed it um, a different kind of question, kind of like Kobe, um, around the issue and said, if climate change is indeed a grave danger, then what should you do about it, okay? So the if is for now unanswerable. There's a lot of uncertainty, but let's assume that it will be a grave danger. What do you do about it? And we were making the argument that one thing that appears pretty certain because of, partly because of the science and partly because of the, the half-life of carbon dioxide and because of the way the greenhouse uh, effect works, but especially because of human behavior, that the one big proposal that's been on the table for many years to address climate change probably won't work. That was our that was our kind of starting argument, and what we our use of carbon. Yeah, you, what we meant you by can't that. can't persuade us to do that. Exactly. That while in a perfect world, if we could eliminate all carbon, and that would uh, begin to reverse the greenhouse effect, and that would return our climate to exactly where we want it. If that were all true, which which it, it, perhaps it could be, the fact is that you need to get about seven billion people to kind of voluntarily or by price agree to do something that is opposite what they want to be doing. Yeah. So we said, since that's going to be so very difficult, um, what if we could talk about alternative uh, options if indeed climate change becomes exceedingly dangerous? Yeah. And then we brought up a kind of suite of ideas, uh, suite with an SU, um, that, are, that are all under the umbrella of what's called geoengineering, the very name of which makes people recoil a lot like some people recoil the minute you bring abortion yeah. into a topic. And so these involve manipulating in some ways very gentle and in some ways not as gentle the climate to uh, produce a temperature under which we can all live. The irony is that many people who recoil at the idea of intentionally manipulating the environment in any way uh, fail to acknowledge that the reason that we think we are where we are is because we have intentionally manipulated the environment in a yeah. grave way. But you, but you sort of touch on the fact that, you know, having lots of windmills, you know, might not work particularly well. It, might, there, some, it might one day, but not so, Solar now. panels, don't right. But so I want to just force you on to, what, to, but what's the solution that you, as it were, endorse or think's worth investigating? Right, so there were two major solutions, one of which is less crazy than the other. You want the more crazy one first or the less crazy one first? It's less of a crazy one I was aiming for, but that's You want it. the crazy well, one? Well, to illustrate the freakishness of your <laughs> Uh, okay. Economics. So, do you all know, uh, you know, Monk painted many versions of the scream, which I'm sure you've all seen at least a few of, right? And he's screaming, and you remember what color the sky is behind? Remember, it's a very fiery, bloody yeah. red. 
And that's because, apparently, uh, this was a year after, the year of, I believe it was Krakatoa, right? So when a volcano, a big super volcano blows, it spews a great deal of sulfur dioxide and other stuff into the sky, and um, into, into the stratosphere, actually. And what that does, the long-term effect, is for a period of up to a year, a year and a half, it actually refracts enough sunlight so that there will be global cooling to the order of a one or two degrees Fahrenheit. So, um, if that is uh, desirable, not saying it is, but if it is, so let's say that the Earth begins to get habitually much too warm, what would happen if some mad scientists, who we happen to know a few of that, and, yeah. and we wrote about, could replicate um, that big volcano, except rather than depending on a volcano to blow up at just the right time in just the right place, what if they could replicate that with science by, let's imagine, uh, stringing up a fire hose to the stratosphere and outfitting it with very lovely high-tech nozzles that would spray a fine mist of sulfur dioxide, or maybe it's even water, because there are a lot of uh, chemicals that can produce the greenhouse effect how, how, and refract some sunlight. How big is this uh, hose pipe? How, how tall is this going to be? Are, are know, we talking I, honestly, 100 yards, a mile? No, 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 no. A yeah. few, several kilometers. I forget several the number kilometers. now. So, so, yeah, a few miles up in the sky. Yeah. So it's quite a long hose pipe. It's a long uh, hose pipe. Yeah. But it's not Because I have literally ro rolling mine in in the garden and taken out again. And, but yeah, and, and how is it going to be held up? Uh, a, uh, you know, bl uh, balloons, weight-bearing balloons. So, right. And it would be pumped by these kind of, the kind of pumps that are in a swimming pool. Now, the key thing is, Let's just pretend for a minute that this were viable, which the scientists believe it is, but let's pretend yeah. it's viable scientifically. Politically, it immediately becomes, okay, how many hoses are there? And is it Putin with his knob hand yeah. on the thermometer? Or is it Obama? Or is it, was it Hugo Chavez at one point? You know, these are the kind of people. So depending on the price of oil, heating oil, and the yeah. price of a lot of other things, you might have great disputes. So the governance is an entirely different discussion. Yeah. The morality is a different one, but it is the concept of thinking different or freakishly, yeah. which is if the proposed solution on the table, while morally delicious, like let's not use carbon, is practically impossible, might there be alternative solutions to consider? Yeah. That's the idea. So uh, when you stray into these, uh, these other areas of discussion, do you, do you ever worry that you're getting into areas that you're, you, you don't know enough about to be able to, to, uh, to deal with as an economist? Yeah. yeah, so we never, ever try to pretend we know stuff we don't know. And, uh, and we know nothing about climate science. And none of the arguments we made were really predicated on understanding very much about climate science. What we really did, to put it in kind of Kobe terms, what, what, what Kobe the eater said is, you know, instead of, like Dubner said, instead of trying to make my stomach big, I'm kind of eat each hot dog fast. And it turned out that wasn't the big. We just kind of took the, the issue of, of global warming and we said the issue isn't, you know, how to have less carbon, which is right. Basically, everyone frames it. How do we reduce greenhouse gases? We just took a really simple view of the world, which is if the Earth's too hot, what's the cheapest, fastest way to cool it down? Okay, which is which is a question which isn't really about, you know. So then we go to the scientists and, and look at the published yeah. record on it. So, um, so what we added there, I think, was really a different worldview. And again, it was so critical to step back from the morality, because the arguments about climate change are so laden with morality, how we have ruined the Earth for the future, which is you know, probably true, okay, that's fine. But it doesn't, it doesn't help you necessarily to have a lot of guilt about it, if the real, I mean, so here's my view. You've still got to find a solution. That's you find the solution, and, and maybe you don't even, maybe we're not ready yet, as, as, a, as, a, as citizens of the globe, to actually start uh, shooting sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere, okay? But I kind of think of it this way. To, to carry out a small-scale experiment where we put sulfur dioxide in small quantities up there and we measure what happens, in order to know how reactive it is and, and, and how effective it is, would pose no risk to humankind or the planet, okay? It would cost almost nothing. It would cost, you know, this whole plan per year would cost, I don't know, I think a couple hundred million dollars as opposed to the price tag on, on, on carbon, you know, which is like, you know, a trillion dollars or something every year. And basically, why not figure out whether we have options for, say, when the Greenland uh, ice shelf starts to just float away into the oceans and we have complete world catastrophe on our hands, why wait until that moment to progress science? But that's exactly the attitude that has happened. And the scientists who have published these articles have been completely unable to be funded by any government, government terrified 
of, uh, of Duitz. In fact, the, one of the few people who've been willing to, to fund this stuff at all, but he did it really quite secretly, was Bill Gates, because Bill Gates thought the science made sense, but he didn't, want it, he didn't want any attention for funding these geoengineering experiments, because he was afraid people wouldn't like him. I suppose you're, once it. you start doing that, you're then in control of the climate in a very direct way. You're turning it on and off, and people have different views about how hot or cold yeah. they want it to be. I mean, it's actually, it's, it's completely amazing that anybody with $100 million can choose the temperature of the Earth right now. Okay? I mean, that's just a fact of life. And there's really no internet. So, so another way we didn't talk about, which, which I don't think there's any international law that could stop someone from doing, is that if you, uh, what was it, 10,000 dinghies? You need 10, so basically, if you put 10,000 little solar-powered dinghies out into the ocean, and behind them, you had them spray up sea salt. Okay, that the sea salt will rise up and will form clouds, and clouds are more reflective than, than water. The ocean's very dark, so it absorbs the heat. You actually, with 10,000 diggies, it's estimated, could reduce, uh, the, could return the, the temperature of Earth to pre-industrial levels. Oh. And oh. I don't know how you, you can't stop a guy, a crazy guy, or a smart guy, or a guy who likes to have fun, from putting 10,000 dinghies out in the ocean well, and putting around. We better because if there's one guy with these 10,000 dinghies, another one with these hose Exactly, the, uh, no, it's, it's exactly gonna right. be, it's going to be, I, I'm going to go to questions from the audience. Just one thing I wanted to, not exactly pick you up on, but just make a, make a point in passing, is you, you, you make the point that something like vaccination is, is, is not obvious when somebody first comes up with it. We're going to take mm. uh, a little bit of germ and mm. put it in you. Uh, and then uh, in a nearby page, you say, of course, George Bernard Shaw was a great thinker <laughs> and came up with hundreds and hundreds of ideas, as he himself uh, claimed. Um, but, but oddly enough, and I just wanted to make this point, uh, it, he was a, vi a virulent opponent of vaccination throughout his very long life. And had he been listened to on that yeah. point as a sort of a somewhat unconventional thinker, we wouldn't have eliminated uh, smallpox from the world. But, yeah. uh, so, I mean, that's a great example of another thing we talk about. But what's the word? I never remember that word. It's too long. Alta crepidarianism. So it's uh, whatever the word is. <laughs> uh, you can look it up. It's in the book. But one of the things that you see so much is that when somebody is good at something, they then assume, and often society assumes, that they're going to be good at everything else, too. And I think it's a classic example of this halo effect which happens in which, um, you know, if, if, in which expertise or genius is thought to be very transportable. And I, I think, well, really, Clive, yeah. that's what you accused us of about five minutes ago. Well, uh, and we tried to deny it was true. Yeah. So we tried to say, no, we're actually just using the same stuff over yeah. and over. Well, uh, it's, it's a reasonable point, though. If you're an expert, as you are, on e e economic, e economics, uh, then you're not necessarily going to understand all the ramifications of pumping sulfur dioxide into the air or uh, a crime, necessarily, right. whatever. No, yeah. I think you're right. So I think, I think the key fact is that I'm not even an expert in economics, right? So uh, much less climate science. What I think the only thing that I'm good at, really, are two things, maybe, which is taking a pile of data and making sense of it and being uh, unrestrained enough to offer really dumb ideas out in public and not be embarrassed about the fact that people are going <laughs> to yeah. laugh at me. I mean, those well, are my traits, yeah. and there's a common theme that runs through everything we do. Okay. <laughs> right, well, there's lots of other uh, subjects covered in your books, but uh, as, as I've promised uh, more than once now, um, so, oh, that's, I, excellent, I can see a hand go up immediately, so... Well, we'll see how this works. So you're on an experiment. Let's hope this works really well. A microphone gets you. You ask a nice, clear question. And Hi, guys. Um, I'm a huge fan of the podcast, so th for turning up. I just wanted to um, ask about kind of tools for thinking like a freak, because it seems to me the, the success of your books and, and podcasts, et cetera, is that it, it kind of brings a, you know, we're in this age of big, big data now, and we're all trying to understand how Google controls our lives and, and how we can control it as well. So my question is, other than your own book, what would you recommend as tools for people to use to learn to you know, think like a freak? Because so often the people who, uh, so often the people who, who think magically are confident and arrogant, and the people who want to ask questions differently are humble. So, All right. so what other tools are out there to, uh, to yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, good, no, good question. Good, good, good question. Really good. So maybe your, your books, I your, don't your, know. your tools is what he wants to know about, first no, of our, all. Well, our <laughs> tools are easy because we wrote the book. I, yeah. I, I mean, look, okay, so what our very first tool in the book is learn to say I don't know because so much of what we've been talking about today yeah. is right. The flip side of ultra crepidarianism or whatever it is, is acknowledging when you look at a difficult situation or problem that you may not know at all what the solution is. Yes. And in politics, we see, you know, we actually went through the presidential debate records of 40 or 50 years and found that no candidate ever appeared 
to be willing at least to admit that he didn't really know how something would turn out. In We're deathly US. afraid of it. In the US, yeah. right. And um, on, in the, on the media, you know, if yeah. you're the kind of person who would get on TV or radio and someone would ask you a very difficult question, and you, you, even a very difficult question, you would say, you know, I, I wish I knew the answer to that, but it's hard to say because of X, Y, Z, we'll try to find out. So we, it, we it, it, um, encourage people to take that as a first step, to admit what they don't know. But could you, just to interrupt, could, uh, could a politician do that? Not America so you know, or any other country. I think that is a great question. I would, I, we argue that it would be a wonderful world if that were so. Yes. Honestly, I think the way the game is constructed, they would probably lose. And that's not really their fault. That's yeah. the way the incentives are set up. Yeah. In terms of other tools beyond what we do, right. I, I love the question. I don't know the answer to your question, though. <laughs> so practicing my, but um, no, I, I don't mean no, to make light of it. He wants you to recommend other people's works. Yeah, they might, so they're, they're, I will they're, say. They're gonna buy your book as well, don't worry. I will worry, say, but look get, in, um, so we write, uh, we have this unbelievably voluminous endnote section to all our books that I do uh, for fun and just to have all the sources there, and no one has ever read an endnotes out of, we've sold mm. seven million books that I've never heard from anyone who actually commented on something that was in the endnotes. Mm. If you care to be the first person to ever read the endnotes in any of our books, you mm. will find a library worth of where we steal our ideas from. So, yeah. I, mean, I kind of agree, but I have two suggestions of, of, of books that I really like because they, they've changed, these are people who've changed what I think. And the, the first one is Nudge by Daler and Sunstein. And this has actually had a huge impact uh, in the UK because of the Behavioral Insights team, which is an incredibly forward-looking uh, uh, team. We can talk more about it uh, later if you want, uh, within the UK government. Um, and the, nudge, the, the idea behind Nudge, essentially, is typically economists have viewed the world, which is through the lens of incentives. That if I can give you the right incentives through prices or something else, I can get you to change your behavior by responding. And nudge is something which is more brought from psychology, which says people are busy, people are distracted, so if we just trick them, we can get them to do whatever we want. It's just a matter of taking advantage of their lack of attention. And so it's a great book with lots of examples, and it's, a, it's an incredible toolkit to have, in, to have if you want to change people's behavior. And the other book, which has been phenomenally successful in the UK, is Thinking Fast and Slow by Danny Kahneman. It's a, I mean, Kahneman is the, the godfather of, of behavioral economics, which is the intersection of economics and psychology. And it's a tough read. I mean, so unlike Nudge, which is fun, I mean, um, I think the Kahneman book has been far more purchased than read. But uh, look, you'll, you'll impress people just by having it in your shelf, even yeah. if you can't get through more than a few pages. But it's a pretty good book. You, but you also mentioned your book sometimes, Mal uh, Malcolm Gladwell, with uh, you know, uh, The Tipping Point and those, those sort of books, who, who does have a similar-ish kind of approach to some of the issues. Yeah, I say, so I look, I love Malcolm Gladwell's books. I think they're great storytelling. But I think they fall into a different category, because I really think those are storytelling books. I think they're yeah. not really uh, ways of thinking. They're, uh, they're about entertaining and, uh, and make, I'm, basically, when you read Malcolm Gladwell's books, for the six hours it takes you to read it, you feel like you are the smartest person on the planet. And that is an incredible gift to give to someone. Yeah. But I, and when we're but, reading your books, we're, we're supposed to think you too are the uh, smartest person No, no, you're uh, supposed to feel planet. like yeah. the, you're also, Malcolm's really good. So when you read our books, you feel like the third or fourth smartest person on the planet. When you read Malcolm's, you really feel like the smartest. <laughs> but, uh, OK. All right, uh, good question. Um, no longer than that, though. That, that was, you know, an expansive question. Any, any more? Quick? So there, oh, there's one right down here. Oh, it's about two, oh, two okay. down here. Okay. This is good. We're covering two parts of the room. Hello. I'm just wondering if there are any trends that you're seeing today that where you think that there'll be a huge impact in the future. So for an example, one child policy in China or flu vaccines for everybody or uh, kids age three learning on uh, the oh. iPad or something that'll have a massive impact 20 years down the line. So a bit, so a bit like the, uh, the, the abortion thing, which you uh, For an example, yeah, but, it, but, 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 so the but one seeing child, out in the future. What, what about the, what, did, you, did you ever look at the one child policy in uh, China uh, to take that specific example? <laughs> So I've thought about that a bit, mm. uh, and I don't know too much about China, but it is an incredibly radical social experiment, and it's changed so many things, and the attention that's given to individual children, and it's had a huge impact, of course, on, impact, of course, on the sex ratio, uh, because right now, I don't know if there may be 120 boys uh, born for every 100 girls, mm. which 
you know, already you can see the waves of, of you know, men. Many men will never get married. Uh, already the, the age gap between men and women has grown dramatically. Uh, I think ultimately there will be some repercussions. Like, I think it'll be interesting. So one prediction I would have, this is not maybe an important, but one prediction I think that an economist would say is that eventually the poorest of the poor in China uh, will start having girls instead of boys. Because if you're very poor in China and you have a boy, that boy will never be married. And so instead, I think that, you know, it will flip and, and there will actually become a real desire for girls. Or it could put the crime rate up again Absolutely. in those countries because I mean, a lot of I mean, unattached <coughs> men um, without the, you know, the yeah, mellowing I, influence right. of uh, a wife or a girlfriend... That's a recipe for crime as much as anything else. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, 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 yeah. that's, I would not laugh at that. I think that's completely true. I think even deeper, I think if you look, uh, you could predict revolution, right? There's nothing worse for, if, for there's nothing worse for a set of rulers than having, uh, you know, 300 million men, young men with nothing to do, mulling around trying yeah. to figure out what they should do next. I mean, yeah. so, so um, you know, I, really, I think you're exactly right. Uh, well, you know, we should yeah. say uh, China, obviously, one-child policy legislated and changed behavior. But throughout Asia, I mean, there are a lot of countries where sun preference is so strong that the ratio is about the same as it is in China. And so, you know, throughout much parts, but the most bizarre, perhaps, and interesting is that a lot of immigrant Asians to the U.S., have the same sun preference as is exhibited in Asia. So through selective uh, abortion and other manipulations, um, you see a preference is so strong. So I think, in a way, the even bigger question than what becomes of the policy as it's acted out is does the preference for sons change as labor markets and militaries and so on change? Mm. Just, I mean, that's, that's actually a... a I mean, it was a fantastic question, and I think the ideas you embedded in it were really good. Because I, I, I myself, although I have no answer at all, I'm really curious to understand as this generation of children that has grown up with screens 100% of the time, so my own children cannot entertain themselves for 15 seconds without an electronic equipment in front of them. And it's one of those things where, you, where I don't think anyone knows but one could imagine that there are all sorts of ramifications related to, say, delaying gratification. So delaying gratification is an absolutely fundamental skill to adulthood in the sense that many of the things we do, like education, you pay the cost and you make an investment now because of some future return. And so one could imagine, perhaps, that the ability to delay gratification will be negatively impacted by the availability of 200 TV channels and screens and, and uh, all the time. Which could, I mean, but I don't know anyone, I'm sure people are researching it, I have not, but I, mm -hmm. like, that is a question that to me is really fascinating. We're getting a bit in a sort of worry zone with some of these questions, but so just to sort of cheer it up a bit, it, there could also be the fact that, that people can link up with so much knowledge so quickly yeah. and so much information and, and, and data, which is your yeah. particular joy. Um, this, this is from, from, you know, it's only 10 years ago, 20 yeah. years ago. It was, you know, you had to walk to a library. Now, you're in the middle of the night, you can get stuff in seconds. Oh, absolutely. I mean, so I, no one could be a bigger fan of technology than I am. And, and the amazing, we are the most, for, I mean, if you take all of the people who have ever walked the planet, those of you in this room are among the top, you know, one, one thousandth of one percent of the most privileged, lucky uh, um, people who've ever lived. And it's because of the incredible progress we've made in technology in terms of producing food and goods and, and entertainment and things like that. So, so I'm 100 percent, I, I agree with you 100 um, percent with, with um, respect to that. And I'll give you one example. So when I was in graduate school, getting a PhD, if you wanted to do an analysis on the U.S. Census, uh, it took an, uh, a research assistant an entire summer to take this big, heavy magnetic tape, spin it, download it. It was just, it was incredibly person, you know, manual labor intensive. Now it takes you 10 seconds to go onto the web and do it. And it's funny because obviously that's great progress for mankind in terms of being able to have access to information. But I'll tell you, uh, the professor who I did that for when I was a graduate student uh, was really upset. He said, this is the worst thing ever. It used to take uh, a whole summer for a research assistant to do that. And I was the only one who had enough money to hire the research assistants mm -hmm. to do it. Now everyone can do it. It's terrible. Yeah. I don't have an advantage anymore in doing oh, my research. Things move on. All right. So I haven't had a question on the, the balcony. Uh, is anybody up there want to uh, raise their hand? You're being a bit shy. These, these, these American authors, they expect... Oh, yes, sir. I'll stop berating you. 
Um, so over there, oh, you've got to come, I'm sorry, you've got to walk, of course you're in the it's cheap seats. How about just shouting, see if we can do it like that. So up there, see down here, we bring the microphone to you. But, oh, shout. No, don't shout. No, I've been told not to do that, got everything I... <laughs> up there, they're in the steerage class, they have to walk to the microphone. It's like, it's like, it's like flying economy up there. It's just, <laughs> it's, it's, I don't know if there's a price differential, or just you arrive here like, oh God, this question better be good now, I've had all this water. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd like to ask Stephen Levitt what his daily routine is. How does he get up and think, well, look at a whole lot of different data today, or how does he spot data and, uh, and work on it? All right, this is like a nightmare, going back to when you originally met, being asked <laughs> uh, these dreadful questions. What is your daily routine? What do you do? How do you think? Where do you come up with your ideas? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I wish I had a, uh, an interesting answer to that question. Uh, so so do I, I don't. <laughs> um, You know, I used to, when I was younger, I had the luxury of having very few demands on my time. So the U.S. academic system is so totally broken that my requirements in the classroom are about 60 hours a year, okay? And uh, before I started, you know, writing books and coming and talking to nice groups like you, know, I had lots of time to just think. And I would say I spent about an hour a day for many, many years thinking in one form or another, whether it's just sitting on the couch staring into space or, uh, you know, actually, you know, going to the library and leafing through uh, journals from other disciplines to try and see what interesting questions they had that economics might be able to apply to. Um, but, uh, you know, now I would say my life is kind of like everyone else's in that I'm, I'm pulled in a hundred different directions and people want me to go to meetings and, uh, and uh, I got to play a lot of golf because I love golf. And um, so, I don't know. I mean, you, you, mentioned, uh, you mentioned golf in uh, one or all of your books. I, I don't know, but certainly one of them. Uh, you, you had an ambition to become a professional golfer when you, when you were young. How, how close did you get to that, do you think? Uh, so, luckily for me, although I dreamed of being a professional golfer, I wasn't very good. Because the worst possible life you can almost imagine is to be good enough to think you'll be a professional golfer, but instead to spend your entire life pursuing that dream, making about 10,000 pounds per year, uh, struggling along, and then realizing when you're 45 years old that you have absolutely zero skills and you somehow have to make it yeah. the next 40 years of your life. So, so I turned out I wasn't very good, but look, I always have... Better a, to be a ninth-rate golfer than exactly, a second-rate second exactly right. golfer. Yeah. But, but I also have a view that if you possibly can, you should turn your hobbies into money-making activities because they become much more justifiable if you can make money. And so uh, I wasn't good enough to make money playing golf, uh, but uh, Dubner and I have now uh, actually convinced the publishers to let us write The Freakonomics of Golf as our next book. And we've, we've hooked up <laughs> with local boy Luke Donald, uh, a, a, a Brit and a friend, who, um, who together we're going to write uh, the greatest golf book ever, which is going to show you how, by thinking like a freak, to cut at least four strokes oh. off of your game per round, yeah. and by practicing smart, uh, the way Luke does, maybe another two or three strokes. And the, well, the happy news for you, but the depress slightly depressing is that'll sell more books to golfers who <laughs> think they can make themselves be great golfers by reading a book well, than just we, dealing with the problems of the world, global warming, uh, um, crime, everything. We have gotten more emails from our occasional mention of our book on golf than on just about any topic we've yeah. ever studied. Okay. So, any more? Yeah, yes, sir. Right. I'll, I'll come to you further back in a moment. So, we'll start, we'll start here, and because his hand happened to catch, we'll come to you next. Um, not a question about golf, but about data. And you mentioned we have more access to more information than we've ever had before. Yet sometimes it, it seems uh, we in democracies know a less informed than we've ever been before about crime rates or immigration or, or, or things like that. And sometimes even when we are informed about, say, uh, gun control, rates of gun crime, we still make apparently irrational decisions. Do you, do you think we're getting more irrational, less irrational, and what, what can you do to help us? Okay. It's me or you? Well, it's a, I think it's a data question. I'll, we'll, we'll, okay. I'll, don't, don't feel left out. But, uh, so, okay, I'll um, take the question. But I so, think the essence of that question, uh, which is that we've got more and more data, it's more easily available. Uh, maybe there's too much, and only people like you can understand it, and we, it just all washes over us. I don't know if I'm recasting your question too much. No, I, I, no, I, I think... Uh, so, certainly there's more data. Uh, it's more available. I think what has become apparent, however, 
as data has become more available is the fact that public policy, political decisions, are rarely determined by looking at the data. And that, um, so I've been an academic for 20 something years. I've written many papers that have policy relevance. Not once ever am I aware of changing a politician's mind on any issue ever. So my research has been used, but only by politicians who happen to have already made up their mind and look to find that my research supported what they already yeah. believed. And I think, I think that's the final thing, is that economics, econ economics economists have virtually no power in the world that uh, in terms of politics, certainly I know the US better, that no decision is ever made really based on what the economists think. It's always the policy people who decide it. And they have a very different set of incentives. Can, and I, it's, it's, can it's, I give you a, yeah. a local example? Yeah. Today, there have been two uh, bits of stuff put out in relation to there's a, there's a referendum going to take place whether Scotland should become independent mm -hmm. from the United Kingdom. And one side of it is saying, I, th I think the figures are roughly this, that it would be £5 billion better for Scotland to be independent. And the other side says it's roughly £5 billion mm -hmm. better to stay within the United Kingdom. They're using, obviously, different bits of uh, data, but it's from the grand pool of things they're drawing from that. Now, maybe you could provide a service uh, when these sort of debates flare up to say, well, look, I'm going to analyze this figure for you, because that's such a big swing as to Absolutely. which way. It's not like, oh, the we can, it may cost a bit, but it's worth it. Uh, it's, it's pulling in the opposite direction. I mean, given that the swing is worth 10 billion to the Scots, for a billion dollars, I'd be happy to try and answer that yeah. question. <laughs> 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 is this something that's not really the academic's fault or even the general public's fault, but yeah, the, uh, the mean, media's fault. We yeah, have to blame the media. That's for... what I was. That's how I would answer. Is that um, when you look at the people who provide the data that support X argument, yeah. five dollars X, or Y argument, five do, five million dollars, five billion dollars negative, you can't blame the people who supply a very limited shard of data because they want because they're advocates. That's what they are, and politicians largely are advocates. Um, the problem is that the media, of which I am a relatively proud member, is neither trained nor incentivized to, to do that kind of work. And, the tra and those are two separate parts. The training is you need to learn how to understand what you're looking at. You know, every day, if you're a TV producer or a print reporter, you'll get surveys uh, coming across your desk that make an argument whose numbers look foolproof, but we're not trained to tear them apart and understand how reliable or polluted the data are. So uh, I'll give a for instance, let's say, um, all right, let's say uh, I want to ask you, show of hands, raise your hand if after you use a public toilet, you do not wash your hands, okay? Go ahead, hoist them high, let's see what we have here. <laughs> right, so we see a hygiene rate of, uh, okay, 99.5%. Um, so, um, as a matter of fact, I know that, um, I mean, you look to be a fairly hygienic group of people, but I know that um, probably about 30% of the men, at least, are lying to me, okay? And we know because there's actual data on this very question, um, and I gather some of, you know, I'm not a Levitt, but even I can gather this data. I do this in uh, airport restrooms. I carry a notebook, and after, if I need to use one, I'll linger at the sink and just mark down. And as it turns out, about 70% of the men who use a toilet after uh, getting off a plane will wash their hands. The point is, if you bring the 30% of the non-washers in here and sit them among their friends, uh, family, and so on, they're not going to declare their actual behavior either. So depending, if I'm the Centers for Disease Control, and I see the data that you just told me, that you have 99.5% hand hygiene compliance, and I'm a journalist, I might very well run that article. Um, the other part is that journalism, as much as we hate to admit it, is really market driven. Um, and journalism, every newspaper and every radio and TV outlet appeals to its audience. And we write in the new book a good bit about how the smarter a person is, the more likely they are to consume more information that supports their underlying biases, rather than seek out information that might challenge what they know. So you see a bunch of brilliant people who consume media that will, will confirm what they already know. They become more confident that what they already know is right and have ad nauseum arguments with each other across the aisle, which produce absolutely nothing. All right, there was, a, there was a question there. I think it was a female hand, but I'm just, uh, so this microphone should go is it, is it attached to a female? Well, <laughs> I, I haven't got the data on that yet, but I'm, pre I'm prepared to do some in-depth research later, so let's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I am female. <laughs> so, sorry. 
Um, the question is, how did you know, uh, I hope I get the names right, D uh, Stephen Steve. Dubner, yeah. um, that it would be worthwhile staying 36 hours? Oh, uh, How did you question. make a smart decision no. without data? So, all right, that's a great question, but I would attribute it mostly to luck and to insecurity. So um, I, had a, uh, I had an unusual upbringing compared to my peers in high-level journalism in New York, which is that most of my peers were extremely well-educated in families that trained them well to, to inhabit the upper tiers of society. And I came from a wonderful and loving family that was the opposite of that in every way. So we were, my parents were intelligent, um, but I grew up uh, the youngest of eight in a, on a farm in the middle of upstate New York. And um, I mean, one reason I talk so much now is because I never had the chance when I was younger as the youngest of eight. <laughs> and I'm making up for lost time. But um, so because I didn't really, so I had kind of middling schooling until I moved to New York. I was in a rock band. And we succeeded, we got a record contract and moved to New York, at which point I decided to quit that career because I didn't want to be a rock star as it turned out after all. And then I went to um, graduate school at Columbia, which was very fortunate. And there for the first time, I um, began to experience the kind of education that I would have liked all along. So I worked really hard, but by the time I got into journalism at the New York Times, I still felt constantly, and still do, and I treasure it, feel constantly inferior um, to many people who have had many more years of experience and a kind of training that I envy. And so I, I simply do what many, many, many people in my position do, which is compensate by overworking. And in that case, he was the victim, but it could have been anyone. Mm. So, um, <laughs> so had you done this before with uh, somebody oh, else's interview oh, for an hour and you stay for a week? I was uh, famous among my colleagues in journalism and among the people I interviewed for just being a ridiculously, obnoxiously long attention span. So, uh, you know, I've written about um, Steven Spielberg, and you know, these are people who are used to giving a 45 minute interview. So I once got, Spiel I got Spielberg to spend more time with me than you. I spent a week <laughs> with Spielberg, and I talked my way onto his um, private plane when he was coming back from California. I got a free ride home from Steven Spielberg. And, um, and I think just the, the key, really, to doing that, if any of you are writers or, or care to be writers, is just you know, have a sincere appreciation for the person you're talking to and what they do. So like Levitt, the one thing I did that was smart was I really did read all his stuff so that w it wasn't just idle chat or like tell me about what you do because that's not a question that elicits anything worthwhile. But you'll find that most people um, are narcissistic. I mean, we all are. And if you ask them to explain why they're so amazing, they're pretty happy to talk for a long time. <laughs> OK. Uh, this question there, the hand went up very quickly. Yes, excellent. I, I saw a hand up there, so we, I've got Thanks. one to go to after that, please. Um, so my question is, is, it's not, and it's probably for both of you, because I think you'll both have a different take on it, which is, I'm not going to say it's easy to look at past freak but it's certainly easier you can do sort of regression and correlation analysis and things like that and come up with, with a clever outcome. Um, what I'm curious about is, in your current research, how are, are there any characteristics of a future freak idea that either of you think are absolutely essential for you to claim that as, as something with tremendous provenance? Characteristics of an idea that we wish to claim? Is that what you said? Please rephrase your question. Are, are there any? <laughs> no, I, I'm sorry. I, just didn't, are there I had any, bad schooling, like I told I know, you. I'm yeah, sure I others know. would have. Yeah. Future freak. Are, are there any sort of certain character traits of a future freak oh, idea okay. that give you certainty that this is something worth thinking about or, or indeed worth investigating further? Was well, that sort of new, new ideas on the boil? Things, things you're going to be pr attempting to predict the future with? I know you, you counsel against mm. trying to predict too mm. much the future. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'll give a, a quick answer to that, which is that um, predicting the future is so difficult, and it's so much easier to take the past and dissect the past. And so, I'm I'm never certain. I used, you talked about you know being certain. Never certain at all that anything we do will be very good predictive. But I mean, in in essence, what I think you're saying is, how do we choose what to you know? Well, how do we choose what to start working on? And and in that regard, I'd say that. Um, there's a sort of mix of um, interest, of 
what actually interests us, and I think we put a real premium on doing things that are fun uh, and things that, are, that catch our attention, whether or not we think other people will like it. Um, and often data intensive is good. So if I'm looking for a problem, I want something that's fun, data intensive. It's great if it's important, uh, too, and that people will care about it. It's really, uh, of all the things so that get me started on a project, uh, it's I wander around doing nothing more uh, sophisticated than when people say something to me, almost always the first thing I do is I say, does that make any sense? In my head, I say, does what I just was told make any sense? And, um, and a lot of times, you know, maybe you know, one out of 10 times when someone spouts some kind of conventional wisdom, my internal kind of alarm bell goes off and I say, that doesn't really make any sense to me. And I, I really like to study those kind of questions where I think you know, the things that our mother told us uh, are convenient and sound good but aren't really true. And I'd say maybe one time out of 10, uh, the data might support my conjecture that things didn't make sense. So, you know, so one out of 100 times that someone says something, to me, you know, maybe in the end, it leads to something that, that's interesting. And I kind of, uh, you know, my, my formula for trying to come up with what's... I want to move, move on, so I want to try and get another couple of questions in. There was one up there, one down there. So start up in the, the balcony, please. When I was getting ready for work this morning, I heard little bits on Radio 4. And one was, how can England win on penalties if you think like a freak? <laughs> please tell us. All right. If how you, can you, win more? We're, uh, uh, you, cover, you cover penalty kicks yeah, in your, in your know, book. Are you asking, how can England make more PKs, or how can England actually win a match? Because that's a <laughs> yeah. fundamentally that's different crazy, argument. Yeah. Yeah. So, I don't first like of all, the analogy of PKs, by the way. It's a penalty kick. OK, yeah. so, excuse me. Excuse You're English. Me. Yeah. It's football, not soccer. Yeah. OK, you asked your question. I think you've made your point. Uh, uh, I think the, the underlying flavor of that question is you have, uh, you have assumed that you can tell us how to take penalty kicks, and you're an American. Uh, so, uh, but, right. but we you have. have a statistical approach to this. So first wait, of all, wait, just let's to be clear, wait. this paper was written with someone from Monaco. Okay, so it's not a purely yeah. American take. Okay, okay. It's French okay. data. French okay, data. French data. So first of all, let me French just offer. <laughs> <laughs> You're really playing to the crowd now. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> There's another piece of French data. Do you remember that? That will make them even angrier. We did a, uh, in the illustrated edition of Super Freakonomics, we did a, um, what we call um, lovingly the penis flag chart. You remember that? <laughs> where we compared um, penis sizes around the world represented by vertical flags. And um, I'm, a, I'm afraid your Gallic neighbor was number one. <laughs> so. Hang on, I, I, I just want to get my head around this, as it were. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> a, fla a flag is on a flag pole, and it, and it flutters upwards like that. Which, which, which bit of the flag is up to indicate? Well, it was all penis. pole, no, no pole. flag. The, right. the, pole, the pole was the flag. OK. And uh, leading the race of um, measured peni yes. uh, was France. So let's put that aside. Where, where's your, where are you getting this data from? Is this from you hanging around the, <laughs> the, the gents room in the airport? <laughs> Back to football. Yeah. Uh, so let me just offer first my condolences to your country on the following grounds. I, first of all, I love your country very much, um, in part because you gave us uh, unwittingly our independence from you. But then, um, <laughs> but I love uh, that you've given the world so much. I mean, we had a, a little bit in the first page of the new book about uh, the Industrial Revolution, among many, many other things. So I love that you've invented all these fantastic games, soccer, cricket, mm. tennis, and so on, but then you give them to the world, and then they beat the crap out of you, yeah. and now you're <laughs> resentful. Well, you take the opposite approach, which is, a very, which is a much cleverer one, which you invent a game like American and football, no and nobody else, else wants it. to play. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you always win the World Series. We do indeed. <laughs> Um, <laughs> your penalty yeah. kicks, what you want to do, yeah. uh, what it boils down to is this. Um, most kickers go left or right for an upper 90 corner because that's the optimal 
unstoppable shot if you can put it there. There's some risk because if you go too far, you can actually miss the goal completely. Oh, we know that. Yes, you do. <laughs> um, but as it turns out, if you look at the success rate of going left, which is strong side for most right-footed kickers or right for most uh, uh, left-footed kickers, and then you look at where goalkeepers tend to jump, goalkeepers tend to jump to the kicker's strong side about just under 60% of the time and to the kicker's weak side uh, well, to, the, to their left about 40% of the time, which means if you look at the data of keeper jumping, they only stay at home in the center about 2% of the time, which is to say almost never. So one might say, well, if you're the kicker, therefore, why don't you go center? And it turns out the kicks to the center are seven percentage points more likely to succeed. Mm -hmm. So we ask, well, why do so few, few people do it? The reason is if you kick upper left or upper right and the keeper makes a fantastic save, then he's a bigger hero than you, but you did nothing wrong. If, however, you kick center mm. and the keeper manages somehow to stop it with a leg or an arm, then you must relocate your family to avoid assassination. <laughs> and so it's private incentives versus group yeah. incentives. And so if it gets to be that situation, you should collectively encourage your kickers to kick center. Problem being, however, the more we talk about this, the more likely a keeper is to think yeah. about the kickers going center, and then they'll stay there and everyone will weep. So, yeah. so, so what are we to conclude from this? Uh, uh, we know statistically it's guaranteed to be the case that England would be involved in a penalty shootout in the World Cup, and almost certainly the England will be eliminated uh, by that process. <laughs> but if they all kicked straight down the middle, it would uh, be entertaining, <laughs> if nothing <laughs> else, yeah. I don't think, uh, are America and England liable to be up against each other? Uh, I can't remember that bracket. I know we're, yeah. we're seated. I think we're actually, yeah. I hate to say it, are we ahead of you? Maybe uh, one, one uh, slot uh, behind. I think we're 14 uh, FIFA ranking right now. So. If you go back to 1950, we'll I know, I America know. Yeah. beating yeah. and uh, memorably. Uh, yeah, there was a question down here. A good question. By the uh, way, does no, anyone know where Robert Green is today? Was that the, the keeper? The, the goalkeeper, yeah. yeah he, we, Has he been heard from? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was playing uh, recently. I can't remember. Somebody will know. For a high school or something? Who is he playing for now? Queen's Bar Range has just yeah. been promoted from the championship to the premiership. Yeah. So, uh, good. Good so good. that's all right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, there was a question down there that I promised to come to. I, I know you've got, a, a, there was a question down there? No? Have you gone away? Okay. Or oh, maybe you, there was somebody stormed out. Maybe I just didn't get to his question time. So you get another go. Has thinking like a freak made you happy? Ooh. Has thinking like a freak made you happy? Does knowing the world is that a burden or an advantage? That's a great, that's a it's great good question. Good snappy question. Yeah, that's, that's, a, great. that's an all-purpose question for anybody in any circle. I'm going to, yeah. I'll be using that for the rest of my career. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, has becoming Prime Minister made you happy? <laughs> <laughs> Being the lead singer of One Direction, has that made you, <laughs> has that made you happy? This is fantastic. I'm going to come up and give you a big hug afterwards. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, has it made you happy? Come on. You have to yeah. go around the world, uh, look at your data, people mm -hmm. so find it, holes in it. Can't make you happy, surely. So, um, two things. One, you said understanding the world and thinking like a freak are two different things. So I, I, you know, I, I understand that a few little tiny parts of the world, like baby names and cheating estate agents and things like that, I mean, I do, but, but in general, the world is still kind of a, a foggy mystery to me. But yeah, I'm super happy. I mean, I, I feel so lucky that um, these books have, have opened up the most amazing doors. And so the, the kinds of things I've been able to work on because of these books, uh, have been incredibly fun and the, the people we get to meet and I mean we're I mean one of the things we say in the book that, that we really encourage is like thinking like a child and it's really easy to think like a child when you have a thousand incredible opportunities laid out in front of you and you know you make enough money from doing it that you don't worry about money so you just do whatever is fun so so I think um, I, I'm I, I'd say other than while I'm doing book tours I'm really happy do you, do, you, uh, do you still teach regular classes at the university? Uh, are your classes all to do with, you know, hamburgers and penalty kicks, or do you do... Uh, Those are you know, regular yeah, courses. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I, so I teach a regular PhD class, which is kind of how to... Th it's, really, it's how to think. It's, it's how to think about what makes... A okay. good, you know, how to have a good career in academics. I just wanted to get you answer that question briefly. If you're so, has it made you happy? You look, you look reasonably happy. I'm relatively happy, but uh, yeah. I was relatively happy, you know. So my thing is, uh, I, I always wondered about the impact of money on a person's life. Because if you grow up without a lot of money, then you get some, you see how that affects you. So I still, to this day, gain joy from going to a supermarket and buying what I want instead of what's affordable. 
And I think that's a huge could. gain. Now, the thing that puzzles me and that bothers me is why when the rich countries in this world especially, but many, many other countries as well, why when the standard of living has increased so much across so many dimensions, why our overall happiness is not. And that to me is a riddle and a puzzle that a lot of people are working on and no one has really come up with very satisfying answers. One of the biggest pieces of the real, one of the most depressing, is the fact that if you look at suicide, which we talk a little bit about in the new book, there's a relatively tiny amount of good research into suicide. We know very little, really, about why people commit suicide. One clue that's very distressing, you would think that that suicide would be highest among those who are most desperate on one level or another, financially, politically, or whatnot. But it turns out it's the opposite. It's what one suicide scholar calls the no one left to blame theory of suicide, meaning if your life is demonstrably miserable in some way that may be repaired, you may make a lot of money, your political <laughs> oppression may go away, then you have an optimism and a hope that does not lead to the kind of depression that leads to suicide. However, the highest suicide rates tend to be among the societies and the pockets of societies where well-being is the highest. And so that, to me, is a huge challenge to all of us, really, to try to understand better what does make us happy, or if we want a slightly less happy-sounding word, what makes us satisfied, what makes us derive the kind of pleasure that we think we should derive from having all this material wealth, all this relative prosperity, I think what it is is that we used to think that we were, that humans were an, an absolute animal. If we had enough absolute money, food, shelter, and so on, like Maslow said, we could move on to self-actualization. I think that what it turns out is that we're much more relative animals than we ever thought, and there's always someone who will make us feel like we need more. So that's kind of, I am, I am happy, and I hope to remain happy, but I, uh, in my work life, what I hope to address is why we are not all collectively more satisfied with what appears to be a bounty that has never existed in humankind. I think the, uh, I'm gonna get this wording wrong, but I think it's not Yogi Bear, but Yogi Bearer, the yeah. baseball guy, he put it, he, he's a very wise man with many of his sayings, but one is that if the world were perfect, it wouldn't be. Yeah. So if you get to if you got to a perfect yeah. world, it's, uh, that's, I think he's, he's put his finger on it. Look, we're running out of time. We've run out of time, in fact. Uh, so we've had lots of questions on the floor, but I, I just wanted to end with just asking you to include all the questions you've ever had, because uh, you get a lot of correspondence, I know. The so, best ever question? Yeah, the best ever question you've had emailed to you or written to you or sent in. Oh. Uh, can you say what the question is and, uh, and answer it? Sure. Um, so I'll probably get in trouble for this, but let me do it anyway. So. Um, <laughs> The most interesting email I think I ever got uh, came to me out of the blue. And the woman wrote me and she said, Dear Professor Levitt, um, I'm a high-priced call girl in the city of Chicago. And I understand from a mutual acquaintance of ours that you've begun collecting data on prostitutes in the city of Chicago. <laughs> uh, I have a Palm Pilot that uh, uh, has all of the information on all the clients I've ever served is that the kind of data that you're hoping to collect? <laughs> <laughs> so my first thought was, I was indeed beginning to collect data uh, at the very beginning stages of a project, uh, of which maybe 10 or 12 of my colleagues were the only ones who were aware of the project. So I wondered which of my uh, peers at the business school uh, were spending $300 an hour uh, with uh, this young lady. But uh, my response was quick. I wrote back. Absolutely, that's the kind of data I'm trying to collect. Uh, I'd be delighted to get access to your Palm Pilot. And uh, we uh, decided to have brunch that Saturday. And uh, it was, of course, somewhat awkward. I was married at that time and had four young children. And I had to explain to my wife uh, why I was getting together the prostitute uh, that day. But I told her that, you know, honestly, she called me, not vice versa. And we're just going to talk about the day. Uh, anyway, it turned out to be a fascinating woman. To keep a, a long story short, uh, she had a college degree. She was making 80 grand a year as a computer programmer. She decided that climbing the corporate ladder was a much less attractive life than becoming a prostitute. And she used her programming skills to build a web page. And within a few months, she was making a few hundred thousand dollars a year, working uh, about 10 to 15 hours a week. And she couldn't have been happier about her situation. So uh, anyway, it took about 10 minutes at this brunch to figure out how to hand over the data on the Palm Pilot. And there we were. And I already told you I'm pretty antisocial. And uh, there I was. How was I going to make conversation with this woman for the next you know, 45 minutes of brunch? So um, uh, one virtue of having written Freakonomics 
is that uh, we became business experts. And uh, I had had the opportunity to talk with lots of CEOs. And in the process, I had built the standard list of questions I would ask CEOs. And I figured I would just kill as much time as possible asking, pull, pulling a, a page out of Dubner's book, which mm -hmm. I would just ask question after question and make her answer those questions and, and maybe learn something along the way. And she gave me really great answers to the questions, I have to say, better than many of the CEOs gave me about their industries until I finally stumped her, maybe on question six, which is how do you set prices? Okay, and she gave me the same awful answers that I usually get from companies, uh, and that you know, economists is one thing we know how to do is set prices. Okay, but the answer she gave me was not the answer we like to hear. She kind of hemmed and hawed, and she said, "Well, I didn't know what to charge, so I looked on the internet and I saw what some of the other women were charging, and you know, there was a lot of different prices, but maybe 300 was about average, so I just figured I'd pick 300 too." Okay, so that irritated me because. We know how to set prices, and you know, you gotta figure out what your elasticity of demand is, and you need to figure out what your marginal cost is, and then it's very simple to know what price to charge. So I thought to myself, is there some way that maybe I could answer that question for her? And she had told me uh, earlier in the conversation that she had a dedicated phone line that uh, only her clients called her on. So I said, well, how do you feel when the phone rings? She said, well, I, I don't know, I'm, you know, I, I, Sometimes I'm happy, and, but mostly I'm kind of indifferent. Uh, a lot of times I don't even pick up the phone when it rings. And I said, my God, you know, you're a local monopolist. You have a downward sloping demand curve. If you were <laughs> optimizing and you could sell one more unit of your services at the same price as the last unit you supplied, you would obviously want to do it. Okay, she looked at me totally blankly, the way many of you are looking at me right now. But uh, look, the point wasn't to maximize her profits. I was just trying to get access to her Palm Pilot. And so we parted ways, and I didn't think I'd see her again. But, uh, but I teach at the University of Chicago to the undergrads. And, and one of the courses I teach is the economics of crime. And because I was starting to do this research on prostitution, I thought, well, I should, I, I should add a lecture to my, my class. But it's not easy to write a good lecture. And I struggled for an hour or two trying to come up with something good to write about. And then I had this great idea. What if I call up my prostitute friend and I have her come guest lecture at the university for me? Okay? And uh, so I called her and, uh, and uh, I asked her if she'd do it. And she said, oh, no, I, I would never do that. Um, I'm a terrible public speaker. I'm a very private person. I just, I just, I, I, I just can't do that. But uh, you know, like journalists and economists, I sense that probably prostitutes uh, you just got to bargain to the right price, right? There's like no things they can't do. So uh, I said to her, well, what if I paid you your hourly wage to teach my class? And she said, oh, oh, I misunderstood. From an hourly wage, I'd be delighted to come down and teach your class. <laughs> uh, and so she came, and I have to say I'm a little bit embarrassed, but she gave a fabulous lecture, and indeed a third of my students told me afterwards that it was the single best lecture that they sat in on in their four years at the University of Chicago, <laughs> which is a sad statement about what me and my colleagues are doing in the classroom, but probably, uh, probably accurate. It was a great lecture. And then we did Q&A afterwards, and one of the students raised his hand and said, how much do you charge? And she, uh, she said, $400 an hour. Okay? And I became absolutely livid, okay? because I thought that we had developed this relationship of trust, okay? And I knew she charged $300 an hour, but then she lies to the students, and she said she charges $400 an hour, okay? And she's there for two hours, and it wouldn't be that bad if I could, say, charge it to a research grant and you know, tell the National Science Foundation, well, you know, I'm too lazy to write my own lectures, so I hired a prostitute to come <laughs> teach them, and uh, I just need $800 for you to pay from the U.S. government, okay? So, no, this was $800 coming out of my pocket, and I was so incensed at the fact that she would lie about this and, and, and make me pay her an extra $200. Uh, and then the next student raised her hand and, and, and she said, well, how did you decide how much to charge? And my, my new prostitute friend, she, I was sitting over there with Demeter, she had this big beaming smile on her face and she, she smiled over at me and she said, well, you know, the very first time that I was with Professor Levin. <laughs> She said, the very first time that I was with Professor Levitt, he convinced me that my services were far more valuable than $300 I was charging. And I raised my price to $400 an hour, and I tell you, it was the best business decision I ever made. So, look, I don't know if anything we said today is going to be useful to any of you, but we promise you, you send prostitutes our way, and we have a big impact on the bottom line. Okay, okay well, that, that's the end. Oh, that's a very good note to end on. Well done, both of our Stevens, Levitt and Dubner. Well done. Well done.